cover. Great. Uh, so uh, my goal for today um, was to expand on a little bit of the discussion uh, and, and material from the uh, the last lecture we, we watched of uh, the um, categories for programming course. Um, and it, it has to do with an issue that is kind of conceptually slippery for a lot of people to first encounter. And that is the issue of contravariance. Um, I had asked you to watch uh, some supporting videos by Bartosz Mieluski. And uh, in one of them, he actually introduces the issue of, uh, of contravariance and functors um, uh, very briefly. But uh, he, he does so in a way that you know, probably of necessity, given the time, um, is a bit glib. Uh, it's, he, he, he jokes about cheating. And instead of having a lifting a function from A to B, you lift a function from B to A. And, um, and that allows you know, the, um, the lifting to work. But it's a little bit obscured, like what's really going on there? And why is it really going from B to A? And why is it, not, why is it, why is, why is it uh, formally correct and everything? Um, uh, what, what's, what's really happening there? So I wanted to speak about this issue of contravariance. And the issue of contravariance is a very practical one. Um, at a computational level, we actually see it in many spheres um, that you probably never thought of as particularly connected with category theory. Those of you who had the misfortune to take uh, CMPT uh, 400 from me or, or uh, another software engineering class might have um, uh, remembered me presenting on something called the Liskov substitution principle, uh, which has to do with um, what it says, uh, the, the, it articulates the conditions uh, needed to guarantee safe subtyping within in the context of uh, polymorphism, um, typically for object-oriented systems. So if we have one type um, that's a subtype of another, for example, one class that's a subclass of another, there's a set of conditions that that subclass um, has to provide, have to guarantee, or the subtype has to provide, um, that allows it to be treated um, safely as if it's an instance of the superclass um, or a representative of the supertype. And it turns out the reasoning about those things with, with parameters and return values and exceptions um, goes back to this notion of covariance and contravariance. Um, it turns out what's a subtype, what has to be a subtype of what, and what has to be super type of what. Um, it, it, it's hard for students to get their head around initially because it varies in opposite ways for parameters of a subtype versus the return value of a subtype. Um, and uh, this is tied back to category theory. It's tied back to contravariance and functors. Um, and, the notion of contravariance is writ large across category theory. We'll see it again and again and again. And I figure we might as well grapple with it um, directly. More, more substantively though, I would argue that all of you are familiar with this, um, the need to navigate this terrain at some level from your practical lives. And to that end, I put together a set of kind of uh, little, Word, word problems, mostly not drawn from computer tasks, from things like cooking and, and things like transportation and, and planning, trip planning and so on, um, where without realizing it, you've probably been exercising the same sort of reasoning uh, that you're using when you, re when you think about covariant and contravariant functors. Um, and if you learn to recognize what's going on there, it, it won't start to seem mysterious or, or puzzling or obscure anymore. It'll just be, well, of course it has to be that way because when we reason on daily life, of course we make that distinction. Um, so I'm gonna try to drill down. And this is the first time I've done this, uh, built these slides for today and hopefully we'll, um, 
we'll, we'll, we'll make some progress towards better explicating it. And I look forward to, to other questions. Although today's session will probably be pretty full. Maybe we can pause on Monday to kind of take stock of what we've seen because we haven't had too much time for, for genuine discussion. Okay, so um, understanding contrarian functors. Um, so you'll recall uh, the context of functors. Con uh, functors are the structure preserving mappings between categories. And as such, they map objects to objects and morphisms to morphisms. Uh, pardon me, I'm just gonna adjust that light again because it is uh, glaring in the extreme. Okay, that's better, I think. Okay. Um, so these functors, uh, they take, they go from a category C, say to a category D, and they map um, uh, an object in C into an object in D. And they map, uh, if we have two objects, uh, say A and B um, in, in C, um, and they're mapped to F of, uh, I'm sorry, we have A and B and, and it, as two objects in C, and we map them with F to F A and F B, um, then all morphisms between them and C have to go over to corresponding morphisms between uh, F A and, and F B and, and D. That's a mouthful. But beyond that, they have to preserve structure, right? They have to, they have to map uh, identity morphisms in C to an identity morphism in D, and they have to preserve composition in C. Um, so if two morphisms in C compose to be a third morphism, um, the mappings of those first two morphisms have to compose to be the mapping of that composite morphism. We covered this in previous lectures, so I won't elaborate, but that's just by way of, of, of sort of reminders. Um, okay, um, so here's mapping of objects and here's mapping of their morphisms, right? And here is one of these composite morphisms, a composite of H after F, and it maps to FH after FF, uh, where F is on H is lifting H. It's lifting this morphism to this category. Uh, FF is lifting this morphism to here. Um, great, and we compose over here and we're guaranteed to get the same morphism. So it preserves structure and ain't any so uh, old mapping, it's a structure preserving mapping. And just to have sort of a, a tour of greatest hits, um, and as a reminder of how these worked with lifting at a practical level within Hask, we might have something like the maybe functor, which maps, you know, here we have uh, the Hask, the category where objects are types and morphisms are functions between types. So, for example, int is an object, bool is an object, is even is a function which maps any given int into a bool, right? It says whether or not it's even. Um, the maybe functor would map those types. So an int would become a maybe event and a bool would become a maybe of bool, allowing the possibility we don't have an int or we don't have a bool. We have some undifferentiated other value. But critically, maybe has to be able to lift this morphism, this function is even over into here, okay. Um, and the idea with lifting was, was pretty straightforward for something like this, right? Um, so if we have uh, a function to be lifted, say is even, it's going from A to B, from int to bool, um, and we wanna lift it to go from maybe of A, to maybe a B, so from maybe a vent to maybe a bool. Um, so we want to lift this function over to here. What is this lifting going to be? Well, it's, it's going to be a lifting such that we're going to map any objects here. So like a container, as Bartosz Milewski says, right? So like a container, it contains zero or more objects. Um, and we'll map any objects that do exist with F because we got them or provided with them as part of this. Um, I'm trying to build up this intuition to contrast later when we have a function here. Okay, um, so we can map it over, right? Um, and uh, nothing will be mapped to nothing, but if we have a value, we map it over with our function here. Um, 
Uh, so that provides us kind of a nice way of mapping maybe A to maybe B. This is our trusty function that maps A's to B's. And if we have a value, we just map it. If we don't, well, we just have nothing here. Um, okay, so same basic deal with the list functor, right? Um, nothing too fancy here. What does the list functor do? Well, it maps each of these types to be a type here, and it lifts each of the morphisms between types, each of the functions to be a function here. So if we have int, it's mapped to list event. If we have bool, it's mapped to lift to bool. And if we have is even, it's mapped to some lifting of is even. What does that mapping of list even do? We have a function a to b and, and this function here f, and we want a function by lifting it that goes from list of a to list of b, right? With maybe our lifted function went from maybe of a to maybe of b. Here, our function is going from list of a to list of b. That's what I mean when we lift this function. Um, it's like we generalize the function to operate on lists. This function operates on particular values and we create a general version of it through F mapping it, which can operate on lists and return us a list. That's kind of uh, Paolo Peroni's uh, characterization of it, which I'm, of which I'm rather fond. Um, and what does its job do? Well, look, we're provided with these values over here, just as maybe provided us with zero or one values. So does list, right? Um, and so basically we're gonna go through and we're gonna map each of those values in turn from list uh, over here. Okay, um, great. So we have each of these values in our list. Maybe there's zero of them, in which case we have nothing to do but maybe there's one of them, maybe there's two, maybe there's a whole swack of them like here. And each of them will map with F, right? We're given them, we're given those values, we're provided with them so we can map them. Great, we have this kind of generalized version of F called F map F, whose job it is to map lists to lists by applying each of these values to the values it's got. Great, great. Um, and through that process, it converts a list of A into a list of B. Um, uh, okay. Um, okay. Um, now let's talk about uh, particular functors here, okay? Um, uh, so with the reader functor, um, uh, we, we've been dealing with, uh, with list and we are dealing with maybe. With reader, we have something a little bit more subtle. Um, because reader is dealing with a function. Um, so here, or just like with the other two functors, we map types to types and we map uh, morphisms or functions to morphisms, okay? Um, so int was mapped to um, over here to, a so for reader, so for, for maybe int was mapped to maybe event, great. For list, int was mapped to list event, great. For reader, int is mapped to a function whose job it is to take in some environment, that's E. I like to think of it as environment, it's some information um, that's provided and it will return an int. And a bool is mapped to something that takes in an environment and returns a bool. I, again, I call it environment because I like to think of it that way. Maybe you like to think of it a different way, but it's some supplemental information. Um, okay, so so the reader functor is, is, is a functor like the others. I've just written it out like this. I could have written reader of int and reader of bool, but I've written out longhand to remind us that this is actually a function. It's mapping A over to E arrow A. In other words, a function that takes in environment E and returns an A. Um, okay, so how is is even mapped? Ah, now that's the rub. Okay, so we're provided one of these, and we want to get one of these. We want we want to lift f in a way that taking this, we get that, we get it. Okay, how are we going to do this? Well, look, I mean, at the end of the day, we still have an a here, right? Um, 
we have to go through a bit of song and dance with with having to pass this in an E. Um, but we're gonna get an A. We're gonna have it in hand back. We're gonna have this A, and we can apply F to it and get a B, right? Um, but the question is, well, how are we gonna deal with this pesky A? Because it needs like it's not giving us an A up front. You know, with with list, we have this zero more A's, right? And if we if we add A's, they're right in front of us. We didn't have to give it anything to produce those A's, okay? Um, with maybe, if it had one, it was right there in front of us, right in front of our eyes. Okay, great, we could grab it um, and we could apply F to it. But here, we need to do some work, right? We need to have an E. So what do we have? Well, we wanna implement this. All we have is this, but we're gonna get an E and we're gonna be able to give it to this one to get an A. Um, that's the idea. So, so look, um, um, if, if we want to implement this, if we want to lift this guy to map from a reader of A to a reader of B, this function that goes from A to B, well, it's not that hard, right? I mean, um, so uh, what, we're, what is uh, the F mapping going to do? Well, F mapping of it, uh, it, it of, of this function on this particular value is going to give us back some function that goes from e to b, and what that what is that function going to be? Well, look, we already have a function that goes from e to a. That's this one that's given to us. We're defining what this is. F is this guy. R is this guy here, and we're defining what this is. So we have one of these R's. And we want a function that does this. So all we need to do is take this R. Um, it, it takes an E and returns an A, okay? Well, we, we want something that's gonna give us a B back. This is giving us an A back. Ah, we have something that will take the A into a B. So all we have to do is, is concatenate these, kind of daisy chain them. It's F after R. We first do this, that gets us halfway there, gets us from an E to an A. And then we do this after it to map from the A to the B, and we get an E to the B. Okay. Um, and the reason this is so easy, the reason this seems so intuitive, perhaps up front, is we're provided a value of A here. We have to go through a bit of a song and a dance for it by giving it an E, but at the end of the day, we're provided a value can map over to B. Great. Okay. So we're going to be able to map it with this value. We have an A and we can map it to B, right? Okay. Um, okay, so let's take a, a look at some of this. Um, uh, so uh, here we, we need and we want to produce something that goes from E to B. We have at our disposal something that goes from E to A. And another way to view it is we'll just take our E here that we're given and we'll give it to this one and that will allow us to get an A and then we'll map it over with that. That's another way to view what's kind of going on here. Great. Okay, now apply in this ointment. The thing that's confusing to a lot of students is contravariance. All these things have been covariant and contravariant functors are, the, are places where people get get tripped up. But if you understood what I was just saying, you'll see why the difference develops. I was just emphasizing certain points, like functor after functor were provided this value here with, with the list functor were provided these values for this function were provided that, that value and maybe. Um, and if you, if you pay attention to that, you'll be able to get the key distinction or what or my view is one of the key distinctions to allow you to understand this. So with a, recall for a given category C, C op, which is so-called opposite category. It is the same objects as C, um, but all the morphisms are reversed. It's the same morphisms, they're just viewed in reverse, okay? Um, they're viewed as going, so if a morphism in C went from A to B, we view it as going from B to A. Um, uh, and uh, a contravariant functor from F to D is just a 
covariant functor from C op to D. In other words, it maps objects to objects. It's the same object as in C, but the morphisms are mapped. It's the, it, it, we view them as coming from B to A, okay? Um, so, so this is mapping uh, in the, sort of the flip, um, the flip way, okay? Um, um, so I've talked about this a little bit before, but I, I think I have may have a better strategy for shedding light or at least a different strategy that you won't have seen before. So I wanna talk about what I'm calling here for lack of a better term for it. I'm sure there is one, the co-reader function. Uh, okay, so you recall the reader functor earlier. Uh, with reader, we mapped here, we mapped uh, a given type A into a function that goes from E to A. For example, int was mapped to a function type that would run from this environment, took an environment and produced an int. Bool was mapped to a function type that took an environment and returned a bool. Mm. And in general, A is mapped, type A is mapped to E, you know, a function that goes from E to, to A. Um, the co-reader is the reverse, that the kind of the A ends up in a different place. Now, instead of going from E to A, it's going from A to V, where V is some value. We kind of interpreted E as an environment. Um, it's a bit of supplemental information. V, by contrast, is a, is a value here, I like to think of it. And, and this functor maps, say, int, to int dash v. Uh, this is a function that takes an int as an argument. Mm. It takes in an int as a formal parameter, okay? And it returns a v. Um, it maps bool to something that takes a bool as a parameter um, and returns a v. Mm. Um, and we have to lift is even to go between these, right? We, we, we have, uh, what int is mapped to, we have what bool is mapped to, and somehow we would need is even to map between these to go from this function that takes an int and returns a value to this function that takes a bool and returns a value. Okay, okay, so how, how we're gonna do that? Well, um, here, the important point to make is that while in list and maybe in reader, we are provided values of type A that we can map with F. Here we're not, not at, not at all. In fact, we need values of type A to do the job here. It's, it, it's not providing us, it's like providing us with negative values. It needs the values to do this job, the values of type A. We're not given them, it needs them. And what are we, what are we trying to produce? We're trying to produce something that needs a B and returns a V. And we have at our disposal something that needs an A and can give us a V. Now, this is kind of the opposite of what we were thinking about before. We, we had for maybe, we had the value of A right in front of us over here on the left. For list, we had, you know, potentially a bunch of values right in front of us. For reader, we had to go through a song and dance with an environment, but basically we had a value given to us to we could map with F. Here, it needs an A. So we wanna implement something that needs a B and returns uh, a V. And instead we're giving something that requires an A and returns a V. Okay, it, it, it gets us partway there, but it's kind of in the opposite direction. Um, we know how to get a B, a V from an A, but we need something that can get a B, a V from a B. So how are we gonna work this? Well, the idea is, look, we wanna implement this guy. All we have is something to go from an A to a B. So we need a way of converting Bs into As. If we could just convert a B into an A, then we could use this guy and complete it. And you know, another way to think about it is if this, if this, uh, function, we're kind of going in the opposite direction. Remember, with a contravariant functor, we're going from C up. Um, so all the arrows are reversed. So it's almost as if 
we need a way of going from bool. If we had a thing which went bool to int, now that would allow us to then map a uh, into a v um, uh, to become a bool to a v. Because if we we want to have a, a bool to a v, we take in the bool, we give it to this function which goes from bools to ints. And then we give that to, to this guy to produce the V. That's the idea. So we're implement, we're seeking to implement this guy. Um, and it's provided a B. And so we use this A to a V to get the V. In order to do that, we need a way of turning a B into a V. Okay. And that's why it has to be contravariant. But let's 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 take a look at this a little bit more detail. Then let's go through some practical examples. Okay. Um, uh, so here we are. Um, here's the function being lifted. The function being lifted is in the reverse direction. You notice it's from B to A here. And again, I'll try to convince you that this is very natural. Because um, we want something. We want to implement something that goes from a B to a B. And we've got something that goes from an A to a B. It needs an A. It doesn't give us an A. It needs an A. And so if we have this B given to us, we can... We can turn it into an A, and that will allow us to do that. And you notice it's the reverse direction. Before we had F on the left and R on the right, it was F dot R. Now we have uh, uh, this this uh, value here um, on the the right, and uh, this F. So F goes first. Um, uh, this uh, this F we we've given a B. We map it to an A, and then we can use this to complete the mapping. Um, this uh, uh, this one here, which which will uh, complete. This is the co-reader CR. Uh, it'll complete the job. So all we do is we convert this B to an A, so that we can finish the job with this one. Um, okay. Um, so here are some examples. Um, I tried to come up with these, and forgive my my simplicity of my imagination, okay? Okay, first example, uh, we have a recipe, okay? Um, so we have a recipe, um, uh, take that as kind of our, our input, okay? Um, uh, and it describes, um, so that's kind of our, this one, um, this A to the V, uh, this one here. This is our existing recipe. Um, you can see it's labeled C to A here, okay? Um, uh, and actually, this is the covariant version. Then I'll deal with the contravariant. This is the, the covariant version um, first. Okay, we have a recipe. And what it does is it's, it's a simple recipe. It says, look, if you have chopped tomatoes, sliced cilantro, and extracted egg whites, that's type C. And it tells us, given that, how we can create an omelet type A, okay? A whole omelet. It's just a kind of finishes up and, and that's the end of the recipe, just uh, uh, just the omelet in the pan. Okay. Um, and so this recipe goes from C to A, right? It turns these things, um, it needs these things, the chopped tomatoes, sliced cilantro and the extracted egg whites, uh, and it'll create for you and an A, namely a whole egg white omelet. Okay, great. Um, but we want to create, so that's our, that's, um, yeah, uh, it's a, actually for the co-reader. It's this guy here. That's that's what this one is, um, okay? Um, and we want to create one of these. So we want to create something that starts with those same ingredients, uh, but produces a cross-sliced, egg white omelet with sriracha sauce, okay? Um, so uh, so all it does is it, it takes what we have here and it slices it and, and it's, it's gonna um, have the sauce with it, this, this uh, hot sauce, uh, which is really, uh, really good, um, uh, hot and sour. Um, okay, so the question is, what do we need to do this? I kind of alluded to it there, but... Um, how, how are we going to take this recipe and turn it into a recipe that does that? So I'm going to give you two choices, okay? Um, 
So what we have is a recipe that does this, turns these things into a whole omelet, and we want a recipe that does this. So we're writing our own little recipe that builds on this existing recipe. What do we need? Tell me, do we need a way of turning a whole omelet into a, a, a cross-sliced omelet, sort of Japanese-style omelet with shiratra sauce? Or do we want a way of turning a cross-sliced um, omelet with sriracha sauce into a whole omelet? What, what do we need in order to create a recipe for this, um, from a recipe for this, what, which of these two do we need to supplement it with to get a recipe like this? Anyone? Is it the first or the second? The first. The first of them. Yeah, it's very simple. We just take what we got here as the output, which is a whole omelet, and we turn it into a cross slice omelet. We slice it up by crossing it across, you know, cutting it across itself, um, folding it and cutting it across itself and doing the sriracha sauce. And we've got a delicious uh, omelet, okay? Um, uh, all sliced in with this uh, hot and sour sauce on it. Okay, um, so that's, um, that's what we need. We have something in hand, namely the omelet. And all we have to do is, is apply this function to it, um, which is gonna map from the whole omelet to this. It's because we have the whole omelet uh, in hand and we could just slice it and add sriracha sauce. Great. So you know this intuitively, like this, uh, it, it, probably no one on this call would get confused to think, oh, to turn this recipe into this one, I'm gonna need to turn a cross slice omelet with sriracha sauce into a whole omelet. Like that would be a real undertaking, but I don't think anyone here will be confused about that. It's very clear what you have to do. You just have to slice the omelet you have into these pieces, and you could describe that in a recipe as going from the start to the finish. Great. Okay. Um, and the answer is exactly that, right? Wade's exactly right. Um, I appoint what Wade the Cephal chef. Um, okay. Um, you probably don't want to do that. <laughs> how, how, how do I compete with you? Um, okay. So, uh, um, yeah, so, okay, so the, the now we have, we're going to have a different twist of this that will show the contravariant reason. This was covariant reason. We had the omelet, we just have to slice it, okay? This is the contravariant reason. And I'm going to argue that it's probably also going to be pretty obvious to you how to think about this. Okay, so we have a an existing recipe um, just like we did before, that goes from these chopped tomatoes, sliced cilantro, and egg whites into a whole omelet. There's no reason it doesn't say whole omelet. It should say into a whole omelet. Okay, whole. Um, uh, okay, um, whole with a W. Um, uh, and but now we're seeking to create a different recipe. So this is still our input okay it's still our our our, our input here um is this guy here that's that corresponds to this one uh we have one of these and what we want to do is produce one of these where b here is um is an, an a recipe that takes whole tomatoes fresh cilantro not not already sliced and whole eggs and we want that recipe to go from this, this different starting point, this kind of earlier starting point where these things aren't yet sliced and so on, not separated eggs. And it produces an omelet, um, a whole omelet. Okay. Um, put aside the sriracha sauce and so on. Not, not, we're not, not adding to the end of the recipe here. We're adding to the beginning of it. We want to do something before it. Okay. We, we want to we just want to start the recipe instead of presupposing we have these things. We want to start it here. Maybe we give a bit of guidance how to separate the eggs. I don't, I don't know, um, or how to cut the tomatoes to be make them look prettify, or whatever. Um, okay, so this is our B to C here. This is what we want. This is what we what we want here. C is is B. Okay. Um, 
This is what we want. This is what we have. This is the like sliced tomatoes, sliced um, sliced cilantro, and, and separated you know egg whites. Uh, this is and we we know how to turn that into an omelet. And we want a recipe that will start earlier. It will. It, it's dealing with um, whole eggs and uh, and unsliced yet unsliced cilantro and whole tomatoes to start with. So how are we going to do that? That's the that's the question uh, intuitively. And what do we need? This is, this is the question where I want your intuition to operate. What do we need? Do we need a way of turning the chopped tomatoes, sliced cilantro, and egg whites? Uh, into whole tomatoes, fresh cilantro, and whole eggs? Or do we need a way of turning the whole tomatoes, fresh cilantro, and whole eggs into chopped tomatoes, sliced cilantro, and egg whites? So if we want to use this recipe as a sub part of our recipe, which starts upstream, which starts earlier, which is starting from whole tomatoes instead of chopped tomatoes, we want to start from fresh cilantro instead of sliced whole eggs instead of already extracted egg whites and we wanna make use of this recipe, what do we need? Do we need this or do we need that? The first or the second? This is what we have, this is what we want. What do we need? Do we need something that goes from B to A or A to B? B to A. B to A. We, look, we, we already have this recipe. If, if we can just get from a whole tomato to a chopped tomato, from a fresh cilantro to a sliced cilantro, whole eggs to extracted egg whites, we can use this other recipe that already exists. So all we need to do for our recipe that starts here and goes to a whole omelet is tag on to the beginning something that turns these things, B, into these things, A, okay? So again, going back to this, this is our recipe going from chopped tomatoes and you know these already separated eggs and sliced cilantro into the whole omelet. We want something that will go from whole tomatoes into the omelet. How do, what do we need? We need something that will go from a whole tomato to a sliced tomato. Then we can make use of this. To, to write a recipe here, we just need to add on to it at the beginning, something that turns whole tomatoes into sliced tomatoes. We just need to turn something that takes fresh cilantro into sliced cilantro. We need something that can take the whole eggs into the separated eggs. And then we can use this recipe. We could use this recipe. All we need to do is tag on the beginning something that reduces B to an A. And that is the contravariance right there. It's because we're adding it on to the beginning of it that we need the contravariance. It's because we need to get to this point. We don't have one of these in hand. We need to produce it. We need to generate it. We need to, you know, provide, we need to. To, to create it. Um, and we are doing so with something that takes one of these things and we can use that to create one of these things, which, which allows us to make use of the recipe. So the answer here is we need something that goes from B to A, not A to B. Why? Because we're doing it at the beginning of this recipe. We need something that can map to the starting point. This is our starting point. And we need something that will map to that starting point from this earlier starting point. That is the origin of this covariance. And if you think about this recipe as a way of getting from this starting point to a whole omelet, now we're having a way of getting from something upstream, something earlier to this omelet. That will actually, that intuition will end up helping you in some of these other examples and help you in general, because what we're dealing with here is very much this idea of getting from one place to another place. And this is a starting point, whereas the omelet was an end point. 
So if we add it on at the end, we needed covariance. It was tagging something on something we already had, an omelet. If we start at the beginning, we need to produce this thing. We need to get to this point to start this recipe. Okay, so we need something that will go from B to an A. Okay, here's another example. I've got to watch my, my time here. Um, uh, we have an we have an optical character recognition system. Suppose we have an existing library. It takes a text file, um, something we'll call it to the type C, and it outputs a PDF file rendering the text. So we take a text file and it, and this thing will output some some text as ASCII text that says what's in that. Excuse me. Uh, uh, no, it outputs a PDF which shows it in PDF form. It's kind of a nice, nice form um, uh, in a nice paragraph form, or whatever. Um, and what we're seeking to do that is build a system that takes a text file and outputs a PNG file. Okay, so we have one of these, and we want to get one of these. Um, we want to implement one of these. This is what we've got. What do we need to do that? Do we need to, so if, if we got this one that, that takes text and it outputs a PDF, and what we want is to build one that takes text and outputs a PNG, we could use this one that builds this PDF and then do what? Do we need from that point a converter from PDF to PNG, or do we need a converter from PNG to PDF? Anyone? So we want to implement this guy, take a text file, and we want to be able to output a PNG. And all we have in the library is something that will take a text file and output a PDF. What do we need to complete the link to be able to implement this? So that we can output PNGs. Uh-huh, I heard sound. Anyone? Have to ping. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We want something that'll take a PDF to go to PNG. I mean, if we do this, um, we can make use of this, right? All we need to do is use this library. It'll output a PDF. Um, and all we do is tag on something that converts from a PDF to a PNG and we're done. That's it. And then we have something that takes a text file and outputs a PNG file. So we have this, we want this, and all we do is we have something that takes a PDF to a PNG. In short, we just have something that goes from A to B. Why? Because we have an A in hand. That's our, that's what was produced. We got an A from this existing thing and we can just map it to a B and we're done. There's no contravariance here, just covariant. We we just turn the A into a B. Great, we're done. That's it. Um, okay, now here's the reverse. Suppose we have access to a library that goes in the opposite direction. It takes a PDF file and outputs a text file giving the textual contents of that PDF, okay? So here the PDF is type A and the text content is type C. And we're, we want a system that will take, instead, it will take a PNG file. This first system took a PDF. This in our system, we want to take a PNG and output a text file of the contents, okay? Um, so that's our B to C. So this is what we want to implement, something that takes a PNG and outputs the textual contents. All we have is a library that does it from PDFs. What do we need in order to build this thing that takes a PNG and, uh, and outputs the text? Anyone? Second one there, B to A. Yeah. PNG to PDF. Exactly. So, hey, look, um, I need to produce, like to make use of this first one, this library, I need to produce a PDF. Right? That's what it needs to, to be fed to do its job to give us text. Now, if we could only produce a PDF, we can get text back. 
So how am I going to produce a PDF? All I have is a stinking PNG. Well, I need a way of going from PNG to P PDF. If I could just go from PNG to PDF, then I can get all the text out. So I want a converter from PNG to PDF. And that will allow me to implement something that takes a PNG and outputs a text file. I'll just, and, and, and I just do that conversion first from PNG to PDF. And then I can call this. But you'll notice it has to go from PNG to PDF. We don't have a PDF in hand to, to map. That's our type A. We don't have one of those in hand to map to a PNG. You know, we, we don't have a PDF. We need it. We need it. That's our starting point for this existing component. We have to get to that starting point. We want this to be our starting point, the PNG. That's upstream. And we have to get to the PDF to complete the, the job to get our RC. So this is what we have. Um, this is what we're given, this thing. We want this. And so how are we going to get that? Well, we need to get from here to this PDF. And, and if we could just get here to this PDF, then we can complete the job. So we need something that goes from a PNG to a PDF. And this is from a B to an A, not an A to a B. It's because we're appending it at the beginning. It's because we got to get to this point. Um, the A is not something we're given, like a list of A or maybe of A or a reader of A where we go through some song and dance, but then we get an A we can map with F. Instead, we have to produce the A here. We have to get to the A to use this because it needs it as a precondition. And fortunately, we have a PNG given as a precondition. Um, OK, so um, you could think of this very much for travel as well. Suppose we had you know, two, two flights here. So suppose we had an existing flight from a source city uh, to, say, Calgary, say, Seattle with Cal Calgary here. So here we're going from, from C to A. And we're seeking to get travel uh, from the start to Saskatoon. Um, so all the way from Seattle to Saskatoon here. So this is C to B. Um, so we're seeking to get to B. Um, all we have is an existing flight that gets us to A. What are two ways to get from, from here, from Seattle to Saskatoon? Um, or what, what, which of the following two do we need? to go all that entire distance. Uh, is it from A to B, that is from Calgary to Saskatoon or from Saskatoon to Calgary? So if we have this flight and we're seeking to arrange to go this full distance, what do we need to tag on to this existing flight to get us this full distance? Mm -hmm. We need something that goes from where to where. We want to get to Saskatoon, and all we have is something that gets us to Calgary given to us. What do we need to do to turn that into something that gets us to Saskatoon? Okay, so this is the flight we can make use of if to get to Saskatoon, if only we could complete it in what way at the end. If we can get to Calgary through this, what do we need to do to get to Saskatoon? Is it this one or this one? Well, this flight gets us to Calgary. We need to get to Saskatoon. All we need to do is to go from Calgary to Saskatoon. So it's this guy here, A to B. Um, we just need to complete it at the end. We have gotten to Calgary. That was produced here. 
You don't need a calendar. We, we here, we, it was produced. This thing provided us with getting to Calgary. So all we have to do to complete the job to go the entire distance is to tag on the thing from Calgary to Saskatoon. And that will allow us to go the entire distance from Seattle to Saskatoon. So all we're doing is tagging it on at the end. We've already gotten to Calgary through this first flight. And all we need to do is to hop over to Saskatoon. This is covariant, covariant. All we need is to go from A to B here because we've produced A. A was produced, this is the reader function. A was produced here. We just need to go to a B and we're done. And that's what that is. By contrast, the contravariant version, suppose we have this flight here from here, uh, Calgary to destination Seattle, and we're seeking to arrange travel from Saskatoon all the way through, through uh, Calgary to Seattle. So how are we going to do that? Uh, to get from the start, the desired start, uh, Saskatoon to the desired finish, Seattle. How, how are we going to do this? We need to go Saskatoon to Calgary That's first. Right. That's right. We first have to go Saskatoon to Calgary. Um, and once we do that, we can use this existing flight. We have to create the condition that produces this. This is our starting point um, for this flight, Calgary. So we have to get from Saskatoon to Calgary. We're starting upstream, we're starting earlier. We're starting with a different starting point that's earlier and we need to produce the Calgary starting point. So we need a way of getting to Calgary and then we can use the existing flight. So this is contravariant. We, we have Saskatoon type B here, and we have to produce an A to make use of this. Uh, so, you know, we want to leave from Saskatoon. We have to produce, we have to get to Calgary, so then we can exercise this option, because this option needs to have a Calgary. It needs to produce a Calgary. It needs to achieve that. It needs to, you know, have reached that point so we can continue. Okay. Okay. Language translation here. Um, um, okay. So suppose we have a, a spoken language translator that can go from English to Mandarin Chinese. Okay. Um, uh, and so it can go from um, C to A. Okay. And now we're seeking to go from English to Thai. Okay. So what do we need if, if, so we can produce something in Mandarin Chinese, that's A, um, Putong Hua. Um, and we want to go into Thai uh, instead. We want to translate from English to Thai. So what do we need? Do we need something that goes from Chinese to Thai or to Thai to Chinese? The solution is actually down there. But. So we have already have this. This is at our, you know, we have Xiao Yan who can serve in this capacity. But we want someone that will translate from English into Thai. Um, what, what would allow us to complete the job? If we have Xiao Yan who could help translate English into Chinese, then all we need is someone who can translate from what? Chinese into Thai or Ch Thai into Chinese? Chinese into Thai. Thai. Chinese into Thai. That's right. Um, and and that will complete the job because if we could take Cheyenne, translate from English into Chinese, this speaker of Chinese who can also speak Thai could translate, even if they don't speak English, they could translate from the Chinese Cheyenne produced into Thai. And we have an entire system that goes from English into Thai, right? We have this. This is Li Cheyenne. We want this, this is, um, you know, we, we, we want to produce this. And so all we do is we take Cheyenne's services and we add them to someone who can translate from Chinese into Thai. And, and then we have something to go from English into Thai. Okay, 
Now here's the contravariant version. Um, uh, okay, so suppose now we have someone who can translate um, right um, from Chinese into English. Um, okay, uh, and we're seeking someone who can translate from Thai into English. So um, now we're we're at a different starting point, right? Where Chinese is the starting point now, and um, we want something that will start at a different starting point. Notice all the covariant ones had had a different starting point. That was what really distinguished them, right? This was um, we had a starting point of Calgary for the thing we had, and we have now have a starting point of Saskatoon. We had to figure out how to get from Saskatoon to Calgary. For the first one, uh, for this one, or I guess it was the second one, Co one. Um, we, we had a different starting point. We had a, a, a PDF uh, already, and we wanted something that starts with a PNG, produces a PDF to complete the, the job. For the very first one with the recipe, um, this was our starting point. We want to start earlier than that. We wanted to have a different starting point. So we needed a way of going this starting point to that one. Um, so with the travel or with the translation here for the co, we have a different starting point. We want to go from the starting point of Thai into Mandarin Chinese. Um, uh, and uh, so we want to translate. We have someone who can translate Chinese and English. We want someone who could, we want an entire system, multiple people if needed to go from Thai into English. What do we need to, to produce this, making use of Sha Yan's high quality services? What do we need to do? Do we need to be able to translate Thai into Chinese? To complete this job, be able to complete, you know, uh, translate Thai into English, making use of Li Xiaoyan, or do we need something that will go from Chinese into Thai? Anyone? Thai into Chinese. Thai into Chinese. We have the ability, if only we can get to Chinese, Xiaoyan can take it from there. So we need to take whatever we're getting here and get it to that point, get it to Chinese. And then Shaoyang can take over. So we need something to go from Thai into Chinese. Yeah. Functions, okay. Um, and uh, we're over time, this is the last example. Um, okay, so suppose we have access to an existing function from ints to floats, and we're seeking to return a function from ints to doubles. Notice we haven't changed the starting point. The co contravariant ones or those covariant ones don't change the starting point. They're always the same starting point. Here, int, they're always c to something. It's, this is a fixed thing. So here we have something that can go from ints to floats and we want something from ints to doubles. Okay, great. So what do we need to do? Um, if we want something, it'll, it'll be that same function, but we want to return a double. We want to make use of this function that can go into float. What do we have to do? Do we have to be able to turn floats into doubles in order to implement this guy? Or do we need to be able to turn doubles into floats? Anyone? Floats into double. Float into double. We have this one. All we need to do is tag on something at the end of it that goes from float to double. And and we're all we're all set. We have this. We're going from the same starting point. We can immediately pass it to this. You know, go go into this. We get a float, and all we have to do is convert it to a double, and we're done. Great. Um, we haven't changed the starting point here. Contravariant ones, we always change the starting point. The fix the the other end, the finish point, is always the same here. So here, oh, this is. Oh, uh, flight, no, 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 input function, sorry. Um, uh, <laughs> not sure how that happened. Um, okay, so we have exa an existing function from float to int, and we wanna return a function from a double to int. Same, same finish point, but different starting point. We wanna go from double to int. Um, making use of this. We know how to take a float to an end. So what do we need to do here? 
Do we need to convert a double to a float or a float to a double? For this guy to make use of this guy, what do we need to do? Double to float. Float, yeah. We have to get from this starting point to that starting point. So somehow we need to get from a double to a float. Just like we need to get from Saskatoon to, to Calgary or what have you, or we needed to get from the whole tomatoes to the chopped tomatoes, and then we could use that original recipe. Um, we have to get from the starting point to that starting point, not going to require going from double to float. Um, and so this you have pre-composition and it's contravariant. We're, we're going double to float. You know, we, we say we want to get a B to a C um, from something that's an A to a C, but we don't map A to B. We, we don't need a map from A to B because we don't have a float to turn into a double. We need a float. We need to produce a float. And so we need to focus on producing a float from what we do have, which is a double. Um, that's why this is, is, is quite different from the covariant form. In the covariant form, we got one of these floats and we can, we can map it to a double. Um, great, we go from A to B. We've got it and we map it. Uh, here, we need to go the reverse direction reverse direction because we need to produce the condition for this to be the case. We need to get to this point and we're prepending. We're sort of starting earlier and getting to this point. Just like if you had directions from um, a certain bus stop to you know, your friend's house or something like that um, and you want to get there, uh, you need to, you can take the transit there and then go follow those directions uh, to, to their house. But you have to get to that place. You're not interested in how to get from that bus stop to your home, but your home to that bus stop near your friend's house. You have to get there because it's the starting point. This is the starting point. We have to get from our starting point to that starting point. And if you think about it this way, it starts to make sense. And there's a beautiful way of diagramming this out in terms of profunctors, we'll see. And um, I'm not gonna comment because we're, we're significantly over here, but I'll just say, um, we'll see that there's a very formulaic way for calculating whether something is contravariant or covariant. You can always check it manually, but there's this notion of negative versus positive position. In a function, this is in a negative position, meaning it needs it, it's the starting point. It's, and that's, that's a negative position as far as um, it, it, something that's, uh, that you need to, to produce this, it needs to be contravariant. This is in a positive position. But confusingly, if you take a function in, in the negative position. If this were a function passed to this, you get kind of a double negation, et cetera. And, um, uh, you know, that may come into one of our, our discussions. Okay, um, all this points to though, going beyond bifunctors to what are called profunctors. Um, and it turns out that what we're dealing with here is a bit of profunctors. And profunctors have to do with wave findings. You could think of a, a sort of a profunctor as, as providing how to get from A to B. Um, um, and, and it does so in a way that it lifts functions to, to get from other things to A and to get from B to other later things um, in a very nice way. We'll come back to this because profunctors are gonna be very, very valuable in the context of what's called profunctor optics, which uh, provide really nice ways of providing local transformations on very complex data structures in ways that compose. Um, so we can very neatly sort of go in and update something within a data structure and compose those things to form larger modifications 
without all sorts of unpacking sort of boilerplate and repacking boilerplate. Um, and profuncter optics will also be a link, interestingly enough, to dynamic systems because dynamical systems can be represented as generalized lenses, which are a type of profuncter optic. So we're gonna see profunctors more. Profunctors are our, our friends and profunctors provide an intuitive way of understanding contravariance as kind of part of wayfinding, um, part of trying to get from A to B. Um, and if you think about it that way, um, trying to get from one place to another, and uh, you reason it through, you realize there's this contravariant reason to get to A and a covariant reason once you're at B to get to your friend's house or, or to slice the omelet and put on sriracha sauce. Okay, so that's all for today. Um, uh, it's a bit about covariant, I'm going to uh, contravariance. I'm gonna um, ask you to review some, some videos uh, over the weekend so we can uh, switch to um, a new sphere. We're getting close to dynamical systems. And um, I'm gonna pick uh, a few videos. Uh, we may have one, one module before that we dive into uh, how this applies. And I think it's going to be on this profunctors and profunctor optics area. Super useful for programming, super useful for dynamical systems. Okay, that's all for today. Thank you, everyone. Take care there.